We came up out of the glady redwood forest onto a road, where there was a mountain lodge, then crossed the road and dipped down again through bushes to a trail that probably nobody even knew was there except a few hikers, and we were in Muir Woods. It extended a vast valley for miles before us. An old logger road led us for two miles, then Jaffe got off and scrambled up the slope and got onto another trail nobody dreamed was there. We hiked on this one, up and down along a tumbling creek, with fallen logs again where you crossed the creek, and sometimes bridges that had been built, Jaffe said, by the Boy Scouts, trees sawed in half the flat surface for walking. Then we climbed up a steep pine slope, and came out to the highway, and went up the side of a hill of grass, and came out in some outdoor theater, done up Greek style, with stone seats all around a bare stone arrangement for four-dimensional presentations of Aeschylus and Sophocles. We drank water and sat down and took our shoes off and watched the silent play from the upper stone seats. Far away you could see the Golden Gate Bridge and the whiteness of San Francisco. Jaffe began to shriek and hoot and whistle and sing, full of pure gladness. Nobody around to hear him. This is the way you'll be on top of Mount Desolation this summer, Ray. I'll sing at the top of my voice for the first time in my life. If anybody hears you, it'll just be the conies, or maybe a critic bear. Ray, that Skagit country where you're going is the greatest place in America. That snaky river running back through gorges and into its own unpeopled watershed. Wet snowy mountains fading into dry pine mountains and deep valleys like Big Beaver and Little Beaver, with some of the best virgin stands of red cedar left in the world. I keep thinking of my abandoned Crater Mountain lookout house, sitting up there with nobody but the conies in the howling winds, getting old, the conies down in their furry nests deep under boulders and warm, eating seeds or whatever they eat. The closer you get to real matter, rock, air, fire, and wood, boy, the more spiritual the world is. All these people thinking they're hard-headed materialistic practical types, they don't know shit about matter. Their heads are full of dreamy ideas and notions. He raised his hand. Listen to that quail calling. I wonder what everybody's doing back at Sean's. Well, they're all up now and starting that sour old red wine again and sitting around talking nothing. They should have all come with us and learnt something. He picked up his pack and started off. In a half hour we were in a beautiful meadow following a dusty little trail over shallow creeks, and finally we were at Potrero Meadows Camp. It was a national forest camp with a stone fireplace and picnic tables and everything, but no one would be there till the weekend. A few miles away, the lookout shack on top of Tamalpais looked right down on us. We undid our packs and spent a quiet late afternoon dozing in the sun, or Jaffe ran around looking at butterflies and birds and making notes in his notebook, and I hiked alone down the other side, north, where a desolate rocky country much like the Sierras stretched out toward the sea. At dusk, Jaffe lit a good big fire and started supper. We were very tired and happy. He made a soup that night that I shall never forget, and was really the best soup I'd eaten since I was a lionized young author in New York eating lunch at the Chambord or in Henri Cruz's kitchen. This was nothing but a couple of envelopes of dried pea soup thrown into a pot of water with fried bacon, fat and all, and stirred till boiling. It was rich, real pea taste with that smoky bacon and bacon fat, just the thing to drink in the cold gathering darkness by a sparkling fire. Also, while pooking about, he'd found puffballs, natural mushrooms, not the umbrella type, just round grapefruit-sized puffs of white firm meat, and these he sliced and fried in bacon fat, and we had them on the side with fried rice. It was a great supper. We washed the dishes in the gurgling creek. The roaring bonfire kept the mosquitoes away. A new moon peeked down through the pine boughs. We rolled out our sleeping bags in the meadow grass and went to bed early, bone-weary. Well, Ray, said Jaffe, pretty soon I'll be far out to sea and you'll be hitchhiking up the coast to Seattle and on through the Skagit country. I wonder what'll happen to all of us. We went to sleep on this dreamy theme. During the night I had a vivid dream, one of the most distinct dreams I ever had. 
I clearly saw a crowded, dirty, smoky Chinese market with beggars and vendors and pack horses and mud and smoke pots and piles of rubbish and vegetables for sale in dirty clay pans on the ground. And suddenly from the mountains, a ragged hobo, a little seamed, brown, unimaginable Chinese hobo, had come down and was just standing at the end of the market, surveying it with an expressionless humor. He was short, wiry, his face leathered hard and dark red by the sun of the desert and the mountains. His clothes were nothing but gathered rags. He had a pack of leather on his back. He was barefooted. I had seen guys like that only seldom and only in Mexico, maybe coming into Monterey out of those stark rock mountains, beggars who probably live in caves. But this one was a Chinese, twice as poor, twice as tough, and infinitely mysterious tramp, and it was Jaffe for sure. It was the same broad mouth, merry twinkling eyes, bony face, a face like Dostoevsky's death mask with prominent eyebrow bones and square head, and he was short and compact like Jaffe. I woke up at dawn thinking, wow, is that what'll happen to Jaffe? Maybe he'll leave that monastery and just disappear, and we'll never see him again, and he'll be the Han Shan ghost of the Orient Mountains, and even the Chinese will be afraid of him he'll be so raggedy and beat. I told Jaffe about it. He was already up stoking the fire and whistling. Well, don't just lay there in your sleeping bag pulling your puddin'. Get up and fetch some water. yo de le he hoo Ray, I will bring you incense sticks from the cold water temple of Kiyomizu and set them one by one in a big brass incense bowl and do the proper bows. How's about that? That was some dream you had. If that's me, then it's me. Ever weeping, ever youthful, who? He got out the hand axe from the rucksack and hammered at bows and got a crackling fire going. There was still mist in the trees and fog on the ground. Let's pack up and take off and dig Laurel Dell Camp. Then we'll hike over the trails down to the sea and swim. Great. On this trip, Jaffe had brought along a delicious combination for hiking energy. Rye crisp crackers, good sharp cheddar cheese, a wedge of that, and a roll of salami. We had this for breakfast with hot fresh tea and felt great. Two grown men could live two days on that concentrated bread and that salami, concentrated meat and cheese, and the whole thing only weighed about a pound and a half. Jaffe was full of great ideas like that. What hope, what human energy, what truly American optimism was packed in that neat little frame of his. There he was clomping along in front of me on the trail and shouting back, Try the meditation of the trail. Just walk along looking at the trail at your feet and don't look about and just fall into a trance as the ground zips by. We arrived at Laurel Dell Camp at about ten. It was also supplied with stone fireplaces with grates and picnic tables, but the surroundings were infinitely more beautiful than Potrero Meadows. Here were the real meadows dreamy beauties with soft grass sloping all around, fringed by heavy deep green timber, the whole scene of waving grass and brooks and nothing in sight. By God, I'm going to come back here and bring nothing but food and gasoline and a primus and cook my suppers smokeless, and the Forest Service won't even know the difference. Yeah, but if they ever catch you cooking away from these stone places, they put you out, Smith. But what would I do on weekends? Join the merry picnickers? I'd just hide up there beyond that beautiful meadow. I'd stay there forever. And you'd only have two miles of trail down to Stimson Beach and your grocery store down there. At noon, we started for the beach. It was a tremendously grinding trip. We climbed way up high on meadows, where again we could see San Francisco far away, then dipped down into a steep trail that seemed to fall directly down to sea level. You had sometimes to run down the trail or slide on your back, one. A torrent of water fell down at the side of the trail. I went ahead of Jaffe and began swinging down the trail so fast, singing happily, I left him behind about a mile and had to wait for him at the bottom. He was taking his time, enjoying the ferns and flowers. We stashed our rucksacks in the fallen leaves under bushes and hiked freely down the sea meadows and past seaside farmhouses with cows browsing to the beach community where we bought wine in a grocery store and stomped on out into the sand and the waves. It was a chill day with only occasional flashes of sun, but we were making it. 
we jumped into the ocean in our shorts and swam swiftly around, then came out and spread out some of our salami and rye crisp and cheese on a piece of paper in the sand and drank wine and talked. At one point, I even took a nap. Jaffe was feeling very good. God damn it, Ray, you'll never know how happy I am we decided to have these last two days hiking. I feel good all over again. I know something good's going to come out of all this. All what? I don't know, out of the way we feel about life. You and I ain't out to bust anybody's skull or cut someone's throat in an economic way. We've dedicated ourselves to prayer for all sentient beings, and when we're strong enough we'll really be able to do it too, like the old saints. Who knows, the world might wake up and burst out into a beautiful flower of dharma everywhere. After dozing a while, he woke up and looked and said, Look at all that water out there stretching all the way to Japan. He was getting sadder and sadder about leaving. Chapter 30 We started back and found our packs and went back up that trail that had dropped straight down to sea level, a sheer, crawling, hand-grasping climb among rocks and little trees that exhausted us. But finally we came out on a beautiful meadow and climbed it and again saw all San Francisco in the distance. "'Jack London used to walk this trail,' said Jaffe. We proceeded along the south slope of a beautiful mountain that afforded us a view of the Golden Gate, and even of Oakland, miles away, for hours on end as we trudged. There were beautiful natural parks of serene oaks, all golden and green in the late afternoon, and many wild flowers. Once we saw a fawn standing at a nub of grass, staring at us with wonder. We came down off this meadow, down deep into a redwood forest, then up again, again so steeply that we were cursing and sweating in the dust. Trails are like that. You're floating along in a Shakespearean ardent paradise and expect to see nymphs and flute boys. Then suddenly you're struggling in a hot broiling sun of hell in dust and nettles and poison oak. Just like life. Bad karma automatically produces good karma, said Jaffe. So don't cuss so much and come on, we'll soon be sitting pretty on a flat hill. The last two miles of the hill were terrible, and I said, Jaffe, there's one thing I would like right now more than anything in the world, more than anything I've ever wanted all my life. Cold dusk winds were blowing. We hurried bent with our packs on the endless trail. What? A nice big Hershey bar, or even a little one. For some reason or other, a Hershey bar would save my soul right now. There's your Buddhism, a Hershey bar. How about moonlight in an orange grove and a vanilla ice cream cone? Too cold. What I need, want, pray for, yearn for, dying for, right now is a Hershey bar, with nuts. We were very tired and trudging along home, talking like two children. I kept repeating and repeating about my good old Hershey bar. I really meant it. I needed the energy anyway. I was a little woozy and needed sugar. But to think of chocolate and peanuts all melting in my mouth in that cold wind, it was too much. Soon we were climbing over the corral fence that led to the horse meadow over our shack, and then climbing over the barbed wire fence right in our yard, and trudging down the final twenty feet of high grass past my rose bush bed to the door of the good old little shack. It was our last night home together. We sat sadly in the dark shack, taking off our boots and sighing. I couldn't do anything but sit on my feet. Sitting on my feet took the pain out of them. No more hikes for me forever, I said. Jaffe said, well, we still have to get supper, and I see where we used up everything this weekend. I'll have to go down the road to the supermarket and get some food. Oh, man, aren't you tired? Just go to bed. We'll eat tomorrow. But he sadly put on his boots again and went out. Everybody was gone. The party had ended when it was found that Jaffe and I had disappeared. I lit the fire and lay down and even slept a while, and suddenly it was dark, and Jaffe came in and lit the kerosene lamp and dumped the groceries on the table, and among them were three bars of Hershey chocolate just for me. It was the greatest Hershey bar I ever ate. He'd also brought my favorite wine, Red Port, just for me. I'm leaving, Ray, and I figured you and me might celebrate a little. His voice trailed off sadly and tiredly. When Jaffe was tired, and he often wore himself out completely hiking or working, his voice sounded far off and small. 
but pretty soon he roused his resources together and began cooking a supper and singing at the stove like a millionaire, stomping around in his boots on the resounding wood floor, arranging bouquets of flowers in the clay pots, boiling water for tea, plucking on his guitar, trying to cheer me up as I lay there staring sadly at the burlap ceiling. It was our last night. We both felt it. I wonder which one of us will die first, I mused out loud. Whoever it is, come on back, ghost, and give him the key. Ha! He brought me my supper, and we sat cross-legged and chomped away as on so many nights before, just the wind furying in the ocean of trees, and our teeth going chomp-chomp over good simple mournful bhikkhu food. Just think, Ray, what it was like right here on this hill where our shack stands, thirty thousand years ago in the time of the Neanderthal man. And do you realize that they say in the sutras there was a Buddha of that time, Dipankara? The one who never said anything. Can't you just see all those enlightened monkey men sitting around a roaring wood fire around their Buddha saying nothing and knowing everything? The stars were the same then as they are tonight. Later that night, Sean came up and sat cross-legged and talked briefly and sadly with Jaffe. It was all over. Then Christine came up with both children in her arms. She was a good strong girl and could climb hills with great burdens. That night I went to sleep in my bag by the rose bush and rued the sudden cold darkness that had fallen over the shack. It reminded me of the early chapters in the life of Buddha, when he decides to leave the palace, leaving his mourning wife and child and his poor father, and riding away on a white horse to go cut off his golden hair in the woods and send the horse back with the weeping servant, and embarks on a mournful journey through the forest to find the truth forever. Like as the birds gather in the trees of afternoon, wrote Ashvagosha almost two thousand years ago, then at nightfall vanish all away, so are the separations of the world. The next day I figured to give Jaffe some kind of strange little going-away gift, and didn't have much money or any ideas particularly. So I took a little piece of paper about as big as a thumbnail and carefully printed on it, May you use the diamond cutter of mercy. And when I said goodbye to him at the pier, I handed it to him, and he read it, put it right in his pocket, and said nothing. The last thing he was seen doing in San Francisco. Psyche had finally melted and written him a note saying, Meet me on your ship in your cabin, and I'll give you what you want, or words to that effect. So that was why none of us went on board to see him off in his cabin. Psyche was waiting there for a final passionate love scene. Only Sean was allowed to go aboard and hover around for whatever was going to happen. So after we all waved goodbye and went away, Jaffe and Psyche presumably made love in the cabin, and then she began to cry and insist she wanted to go to Japan too, and the captain ordered everybody off, but she wouldn't get off, and the last thing was, the boat was pulling away from the pier and Jaffe came out on deck with Psyche in his arms and threw her clean off the boat. He was strong enough to throw a girl ten feet right on the pier where Sean helped catch her. And though it wasn't exactly in keeping with the diamond cutter of mercy, it was good enough. He wanted to get to that other shore and get on to his business. His business was with the Dharma. And the freighter sailed away out the Golden Gate and out to the deep swells of the Grey Pacific, westward across. Psyche cried, Sean cried, everybody felt sad. Warren Coglin said, too bad, he'll probably disappear into Central Asia, marching about on a quiet but steady round from Kashgar to Lanchao via Lhasa, with a string of yaks selling popcorn, safety pins, and assorted colors of sewing thread, and occasionally climb a Himalaya, and end up enlightening the Dalai Lama and all the gang for miles around, and never be heard of again. No, he won't, I said. He loves us too much. Alva said, it all ends in tears anyway. Chapter 31 Now, as though Jaffe's finger were pointing me the way, I started north to my mountain. It was the morning of June 18th, 1956. I came down and said goodbye to Christine and thanked her for everything and walked down the road. She waved from the grassy yard. It's going to be lonely around here with everybody gone and no big huge parties on weekends. She really enjoyed everything that had gone on. There she was, standing in the yard barefooted, with little barefooted Prajna, as I walked off along the horse meadow. 
I had an easy trip north, as though Jaffe's best wishes for me to get to my mountain that could be kept forever were with me. On 101, I immediately got a ride from a teacher of social studies, from Boston originally, who used to sing on Cape Cod and had fainted just yesterday at his buddy's wedding because he'd been fasting. When he left me off at Cloverdale, I bought my supplies for the road, a salami, cheddar cheese wedge, rye crisp, and also some dates for dessert, all put away neatly in my food wrappers. I still had peanuts and raisins left over from our last hike together. Jaffe had said, I won't be needing those peanuts and raisins on that freighter. I recalled with a twinge of sadness now how Jaffe was always so dead serious about food, and I wished the whole world was dead serious about food instead of silly rockets and machines and explosives using everybody's food money to blow their heads off anyway. I hiked about a mile after eating my lunch in back of a garage, up to a bridge on the Russian River, where in gray gloom I was stuck for as much as three hours. But suddenly I got an unexpected short ride from a farmer with a tick that made his face twitch, with his wife and boy, to a small town, Preston, where a truck driver offered me a ride all the way to Eureka. Eureka! I yelled. And then he got talking to me and said, God dang it, I'll get lonesome driving this rig. I want someone to talk to all night. I'll take you all the way to Crescent City if you want. This was a little off my route, but farther north than Eureka, so I said okay. The guy's name was Ray Breton. He drove me 280 miles all night in the rain, talking ceaselessly about his whole life, his brothers, his wives, sons, his father, and at Humboldt Redwood Forest in a restaurant called Forest of Arden, I had a fabulous dinner of fried shrimp with huge strawberry pie and vanilla ice cream for dessert, and a whole pot of coffee, and he paid for the whole works. I got him off talking about his troubles to talk about the last things, and he said, Yeah, those who are good stay in heaven. They've been in heaven from the beginning, which was very wise. We drove through the rainy night and arrived at Crescent City at dawn in a gray fog, a small town by the sea and parked the truck in the sand by the beach and slept an hour. Then he left me after buying me a breakfast of pancakes and eggs, probably sick and tired of paying for all my meals. And I started walking out of Crescent City and over on an eastward road, Highway 199, to get back to Big Shot 99 that would shoot me to Portland and Seattle faster than the more picturesque but slower coast road. Suddenly I felt so free I began to walk on the wrong side of the road and sticking my thumb out from that side hiking like a Chinese saint to nowhere for no reason, going to my mountain to rejoice. Poor little angel world. I suddenly didn't care any more. I'd walk all the way. But just because I was dancing along on the wrong side of the road and didn't care, anybody began to pick me up immediately. A gold miner with a small caterpillar up front being hauled by his son, and we had a long talk about the woods, the Siskiyou Mountains, through which we were driving toward Grants Pass, Oregon, and how to make good baked fish, he said, just by lighting a fire in the clean yellow sand by a creek, and then burying the fish in the hot sand after you've scraped away the fire and just leaving it there a few hours, then taking it out and cleaning it of sand. He was very interested in my rucksack and my plans. He left me off at a mountain village very similar to Bridgeport, California, where Jaffe and I had sat in the sun. I walked out a mile and took a nap in the woods, right in the heart of the Siskiyou Range. I woke up from my nap, feeling very strange in the Chinese unknown fog. I walked on the same way, wrong side, got a ride at Kirby from a blonde used car dealer to Grant's Pass, and there, after a fat cowboy in a gravel truck with a malicious grin on his face deliberately tried to run over my rucksack in the road, I got a ride from a sad logger boy in a tin hat going very fast across a great swooping up and down Dream Valley throughway to Canyonville, where, as in a dream, a crazy store truck full of gloves for sale stopped, and the driver, Ernest Peterson, chatting amiably all the way and insisting that I sit on the seat that faced him, so that I was being zoomed down the road backward, took me to Eugene, Oregon. He talked about everything under the sun, bought me two beers, and even stopped at several gas stations and hung out displays of gloves. He said, My father was a great man. His saying was, There are more horses' asses than horses in this world. He was a mad sports fan and timed outdoor track meets with a stopwatch and rushed around fearlessly and independently in his own truck, defying local attempts to get him in the unions. 
At red nightfall he bade me farewell near a sweet pond outside Eugene. There I intended to spend the night. I spread my bag out under a pine in a dense thicket across the road from cute suburban cottages that couldn't see me and wouldn't see me because they were all looking at television anyway, and ate my supper and slept twelve hours in the bag, waking up only once in the middle of the night to put on mosquito repellent. At morning I could see the mighty beginnings of the Cascade Range, the northernmost end of which would be my mountain on the skirt of Canada, four hundred more miles north. The morning brook was smoky because of the lumber mill across the highway. I washed up in the brook and took off after one short prayer over the beads Jaffe had given me in Matterhorn Camp. Adoration to Emptiness of the Divine Buddha Bead I immediately got a ride on the open highway from two tough young hombres to outside Junction City, where I had coffee, and walked two miles to a roadside restaurant that looked better and had pancakes, and then walking along the highway rocks, cars zipping by, wondering how I'd ever get to Portland, let alone Seattle. I got a ride from a little funny light-haired house painter with spattered shoes and four pint cans of cold beer, who also stopped at a roadside tavern for more beer, and finally we were in Portland, crossing vast eternity bridges as draws went up behind us to allow crane barges through in the big smoky river city scene, surrounded by pine ridges. In downtown Portland I took the twenty-five-cent bus to Vancouver, Washington, ate a Coney Island hamburger there, then out on the road, ninety-nine, where a sweet young mustached one kidney bodhisattva Oki picked me up and said, I'm so proud I picked you up, someone to talk to and everywhere we stopped for coffee he played the pinball machines with dead seriousness, and also he picked up all hitchhikers on the road. First a big drawling oaky from Alabama, then a crazy sailor from Montana who was full of crazed intelligent talk, and we bawled right up to Olympia, Washington, at 80 mph, then up Olympic Peninsula on curvy wood roads to the naval base at Bremerton, Washington, where a fifty-cent ferry ride was all that separated me from Seattle. We said goodbye, and the Oki bum and I went on the ferry. I paid his fare in gratitude for my terrific good luck on the road, and even gave him handfuls of peanuts and raisins, which he devoured hungrily, so I also gave him salami and cheese. Then, while he sat in the main room, I went top deck as the ferry pulled out in a cold drizzle to dig and enjoy Puget Sound. It was one hour sailing to the port of Seattle, and I found a half pint of vodka stuck in the deck rail concealed under a Time magazine, and just casually drank it, and opened my rucksack, and took out my warm sweater to go under my rain jacket, and paced up and down all alone on the cold, fog-swept deck, feeling wild and lyrical. And suddenly I saw that the Northwest was a great deal more than the little vision I had of it of Jaffe in my mind. It was miles and miles of unbelievable mountains grooking on all horizons in the wild broken clouds. Mount Olympus and Mount Baker, a giant orange sash in the gloom over the Pacific word skies that led I knew toward the Hokkaido Siberian desolations of the world. I huddled against the bridge house, hearing the Mark Twain talk of the skipper and the wheelman inside. In the deepened dusk fog ahead, the big red neons saying, Port of Seattle. And suddenly, everything Jaffe had ever told me about Seattle began to seep into me like cold rain. I could feel it and see it now, and not just think it. It was exactly like he'd said. Wet, immense, timbered, mountainous, cold, exhilarating, challenging. The ferry nosed in at the pier on Alaskan Way, and immediately I saw the totem poles in old stores and the ancient 1880-style switch goat with sleepy firemen chug-chugging up and down the waterfront spur, like a scene from my own dreams, the old Casey Jones locomotive of America, the only one I ever saw that old outside of Western movies, but actually working and hauling boxcars in the smoky gloom of the Magic City. I immediately went to a good clean Skid Row hotel, the Hotel Stevens, got a room for the night for a dollar seventy-five, and had a hot tub bath and a good long sleep. And in the morning I shaved and walked out First Avenue and accidentally found all kinds of goodwill stores with wonderful sweaters and red underwear for sale. And I had a big breakfast with five-cent coffee in the crowded market morning, with blue sky and clouds scudding overhead, and waters of Puget Sound sparkling and dancing under old piers. It was real true northwest. At noon I checked out of the hotel with my new wool socks and bandanas and things all packed in gladly, 
and walked out to ninety-nine a few miles out of town and got many short rides. Now I was beginning to see the cascades on the northeast horizon, unbelievable jags and twisted rock and snow-covered immensities, enough to make you gulp. The road ran right through the dreamy fertile valleys of the Stillaquamish and the Skagit, rich butterfat valleys with farms and cows browsing under that tremendous background of snow-pure heaps. The further north I hitched, the bigger the mountains got, till I finally began to feel afraid. I got a ride from a fellow who looked like a bespectacled, careful lawyer in a conservative car, but turned out he was the famous Bat Lindstrom, the hard-top racing champion, and his conservative automobile had in it a souped-up motor that could make it go a hundred and seventy miles an hour. But he just demonstrated it by gunning it at a red light to let me hear the deep hum of power. Then I got a ride from a lumberman who said he knew the forest rangers where I was going, and said, The Skagit Valley is second only to the Nile for fertility. He left me off at Highway 1G, which was the little highway to 17A that wound into the heart of the mountains, and in fact would come to a dead end as a dirt road at Diablo Dam. Now I was really in the mountain country. The fellows who picked me up were loggers, uranium prospectors, farmers. They drove me through the final big town of Skagit Valley, Cedro Woolley, a farming market town, and then out as the road got narrower and more curved among cliffs. And the Skagit River, which we'd crossed on 99 as a dreaming belly river with meadows on both sides, was now a pure torrent of melted snow pouring narrow and fast between muddy snag shores. Cliffs began to appear on both sides. The snow-covered mountains themselves had disappeared, receded from my view. I couldn't see them any more, but now I was beginning to feel them more. Chapter 32 In an old tavern I saw an old decrepit man who could hardly move around to get me a beer behind the bar. I thought I'd rather die in a glacial cave than in an eternity afternoon room of dust like this. A Min and Bill couple left me off at a grocery store in Sauk, and there I got my final ride from a mad, drunk, fast-swerving, dark, long, sideburned, guitar-playing Skagit Valley Wrangler, who came to a dusty flying stop at the Marble Mount Ranger Station and had me home. The assistant ranger was standing there watching. Are you Smith? Yeah. That a friend of yours? No, just a ride he gave me. Who does he think he is speeding on government property? I gulped. I wasn't a free bhikkhu anymore. Not until I'd get to my hideaway mountain that next week. I had to spend a whole week at fire school with whole bunches of young kids, all of us in tin hats which we wore either straight on our heads or, as I did, at a rakish tilt. And we dug fire lines in the wet woods or felled trees or put out experimental small fires, and I met the old-timer ranger and one-time logger Bernie Byers, the lumberjack that Jaffe was always imitating with his big, deep, funny voice. Bernie and I sat in his truck in the woods and discussed Jaffe. It's a damn shame Jaffe ain't come back this year. He was the best lookout we ever had, and by God, he was the best trail worker I ever seen. Just eager and anxious to go climbing around, and so darn cheerful. I ain't never seen a better kid, and he wasn't afraid of nobody. He just come right out with it. That's what I like, cause when the time comes when a man can't say whatever he pleases, I guess that'll be when I'm gonna go up in the back country and finish my life out in a lean-to. One thing about Jaffe, though, wherever he'll be all the rest of his life, I don't care how old he gets, he'll always have a good time. Bernie was about sixty-five and really spoke very paternally about Jaffe. Some of the other kids also remembered Jaffe and wondered why he wasn't back. That night, because it was Bernie's fortieth anniversary in the Forest Service, the other rangers voted him a gift, which was a brand new big leather belt. Old Bernie was always having trouble with belts and was wearing a kind of cord at the time, so he put on his new belt and said something funny about how he'd better not eat too much, and everybody applauded and cheered. I figured Bernie and Jaffe were probably the two best men that had ever worked in this country. After fire school, I spent some time hiking up the mountains in back of the ranger station, or just sitting by the rushing Skagit with my pipe in my mouth and a bottle of wine between my crossed legs, afternoons and also moonlit nights, while the other kids went beering at local carnivals. 
The Skagit River at Marble Mount was a rushing, clear snowmelt of pure green. Above, Pacific Northwest pines were shrouded in clouds, and further beyond were peak tops with clouds going right through them, and then fitfully the sun would shine through. It was the work of the quiet mountains, this torrent of purity at my feet. The sun shined on the royals, fighting snags held on. Birds scouted over the water looking for secret smiling fish that only occasionally suddenly leaped flying out of the water and arched their backs and fell in again into water that rushed on and obliterated their loophole, and everything was swept along. Logs and snags came floating down at twenty-five miles an hour. I figured if I should try to swim across the narrow river I'd be a half mile downstream before I kicked to the other shore. It was a river wonderland, the emptiness of the golden eternity, odors of moss and bark and twigs and mud, all ululating mysterious vision stuff before my eyes, tranquil and everlasting nevertheless, the hill-herring trees, the dancing sunlight. As I looked up, the clouds assumed, as I assumed, faces of hermits. The pine boughs looked satisfied washing in the waters. The top trees, shrouded in gray fog, looked content. The jiggling sunshine leaves of northwest breeze seemed bred to rejoice. The upper snows on the horizon, the trackless, seemed cradled and warm. Everything was everlastingly loose and responsive. It was all everywhere beyond the truth, beyond empty space blue. The mountains are mighty patient, Buddha man, I said out loud, and took a drink. It was coldish, but when the sun peeped out, the tree stump I was sitting on turned into a red oven. When I went back in the moonlight to my same old tree stump, the world was like a dream, like a phantom, like a bubble, like a shadow, like a vanishing dew, like a lightning's flash. Time came finally for me to be packed up into my mountain. I bought forty-five dollars' worth of groceries on credit in the little Marble Mount grocery store, and we packed that in the truck, Happy the Mule Skinner and I, and drove on up the river to Diablo Dam. As we proceeded, the Skagit got narrower and more like a torrent. Finally, it was crashing over rocks and being fed by sidefalls of water from heavy timbered shores. It was getting wilder and craggier all the time. The Skagit River was dammed back at New Halem, then again at Diablo Dam, where a giant Pittsburgh-type lift took you up on a platform to the level of Diablo Lake. There'd been a gold rush in the 1890s in this country. The prospectors had built a trail through the solid rock cliffs of the gorge between New Halem and what was now Ross Lake, the final dam, and dotted the drainages of Ruby Creek, Granite Creek, and Canyon Creek with claims that never paid off. Now most of this trail was underwater anyway. In 1919, a fire had raged in the upper Skagit, and all the country around Desolation, my mountain, had burned and burned for two months and filled the skies of northern Washington and British Columbia with smoke that blotted out the sun. The government had tried to fight it, sent a thousand men in with packstring supply lines that then took three weeks from Marble Mount Fire Camp. But only the fall rains had stopped that blaze, and the charred snags, I was told, were still standing on Desolation Peak and in some valleys. That was the reason for the name, Desolation. Boy, said funny old Happy the Mule Skinner, who still wore his old floppy cowboy hat from Wyoming days and rolled his own butts and kept making jokes. Don't be like the kid we had a few years ago up on Desolation. We took him up there and he was the greenest kid I ever saw. I packed him into his lookout and he tried to fry an egg for supper and broke it and missed the friggin' frying pan and missed the stove and had landed on his boot. He didn't know whether to run shit or go blind. And when I left him, I told him not to flog his damn dummy too much, and the sucker says to me, Yes, sir, yes, sir. Well, I don't care. All I want to be is alone up there this summer. You're saying that now, but you'll change your tune soon enough. They all talk brave. But then you get to talking to yourself. That ain't so bad, but don't start answering yourself, son. Old Happy drove the pack mules on the gorge trail while I rode the boat from Diablo Dam to the foot of Ross Dam, where you could see immense dazzling openings of vistas that showed the Mount Baker National Forest mountains in wide panorama around Ross Lake that extended shiningly all the way back to Canada. At Ross Dam, the Forest Service floats were lashed a little way off from the steep timbered shore. It was hard sleeping on those bunks at night, 
They swayed with the float, and the log and the wave combined to make a booming, slapping noise that kept you awake. The moon was full the night I slept there. It was dancing on the waters. One of the lookouts said, The moon is right on the mountain. When I see that, I always imagine I see a coyote silhouetting. Finally came the gray, rainy day of my departure to Desolation Peak. The assistant ranger was with us. The three of us were going up, and it wasn't going to be a pleasant day's horseback riding and all that downpour. Boy, you should have put a couple quarts of brandy in your grocery list. You're going to need it up there in the cold, said Happy, looking at me with his big red nose. We were standing by the corral. Happy was giving the animals bags of feed and tying it around their necks, and they were chomping away unmindful of the rain. We came plowing to the log gate and bumped through and went around under the immense shrouds of sourdough and ruby mountains. The waves were crashing up and spraying back at us. We went inside to the pilot's cabin, and he had a pot of coffee ready. Furs on steep banks you could barely see on the lake shore were like ranged ghosts in the mist. It was the real northwest, grim and bitter misery. "'Where's Tessellation?' I asked. "'You ain't about to see it today till you're practically on top of it,' said Happy. "'And then you won't like it much. It's snowing and hailing up there right now. Boy, ain't you sure you didn't sneak a little bottle of brandy in your pack somewheres?' We'd already downed a quart of blackberry wine he'd bought in Marble Mound. Happy, when I get down from this mountain in September, I'll buy you a whole quart of scotch. I was going to be paid good money for finding the mountain I wanted. That's a promise, and don't you forget it. Jaffe had told me a lot about Happy the Packer, he was called. Happy was a good man. He and old Bernie Byers were the best old-timers on the scene. They knew the mountains and they knew pack animals, and they weren't ambitious to become forestry supervisors either. Happy remembered Jaffe, too, wistfully. That boy used to know an awful lot of funny songs and stuff. He sure loved to go out logging out trails. He had himself a Chinese girlfriend one time down in Seattle. I seen her in his hotel room. That Jaffe, I'm telling you, he sure was a grunge jumper with the women. I could hear Jaffe's voice singing gay songs with his guitar as the wind howled around our barge and the gray waves plashed up against the windows of the pilot house. And this is Jaffe's lake, and these are Jaffe's mountains, I thought, and wished Jaffe were there to see me doing everything he wanted me to do. In two hours we eased over to the steep timbered shore eight miles up lake and jumped off and lashed the float to old stumps and Happy whacked the first mule, and she scampered off the wood with her double-sided load and charged up the slippery bank, legs thrashing and almost falling back in the lake with all my groceries, but made it and went off clomping in the mist to wait on the trail for her master. Then the other mules with batteries and various equipment, then finally Happy leading the way on his horse, and then myself on the mare Mabel, and then Wally, the assistant ranger. We waved goodbye to the tugboat man and started up a sad and dripping party in a hard arctic climb in heavy foggy rain up narrow rocky trails with trees and underbrush wetting us clean to the skin when we brushed by. I had my nylon poncho tied around the pummel of the saddle and soon took it out and put it over me, a shroudy monk on a horse. Happy and Wally didn't put on anything and just rode wet with heads bowed. The horse slipped occasionally in the rocks of the trail. We went on and on, up and up, and finally we came to a snag that had fallen across the trail, and Happy dismounted and took out his double-bitted axe and went to work cursing and sweating and hacking out a new shortcut trail around it with Wally while I was delegated to watch the animals, which I did in a rather comfortable way, sitting under a bush and rolling a cigarette. The mules were afraid of the steepness and roughness of the shortcut trail, and Happy cursed at me, God damn it, grab him by the hair and drag him up here. Then the mare was afraid. Bring up that mare, you expect me to do everything around here by myself. We finally got out of there and climbed on up, soon leaving the shrubbery and entering a new alpine height of rocky meadow with blue lupin and red poppy feathering the gray mist with lovely vaguenesses of color and the wind blowing hard now and with sleet. Five thousand feet now!' yelled Happy from up front, turning in the saddle with his old hat furling in the wind, rolling himself a cigarette, sitting easy in his saddle from a whole lifetime on horses. The heather wild flower drizzly meadows wound up and up, 
on switchback trails, the wind getting harder all the time. Finally, Happy yelled, See that big rock face up there? I looked up and saw a goopy shroud of gray rock in the fog just above. That's another thousand feet, though you might think you can reach up and touch it. When we get there, we're almost in. Only another half hour after that. You sure you didn't bring just a little extra bottle of brandy, boy? He yelled back a minute later. He was wet and miserable, but he didn't care, and I could hear him singing in the wind. By and by, we were up above Timberline, practically. The meadow gave way to grim rocks, and suddenly there was snow on the ground to the right and to the left. The horses were slouching in a sleety foot of it. You could see the water holes their hoofs left. We were really way up there now. Yet on all sides I could see nothing but fog and white snow and blowing mists. On a clear day I would have been able to see the sheer drops from the side of the trail and would have been scared for my horse's slips of hoof. But now all I saw were vague intimations of treetops way below that looked like little clumps of grasses. Oh, Jaffy, I thought, and there you are sailing across the ocean safe on a ship, warm in a cabin, writing letters to Psyche and Sean and Christine. The snow deepened and hail began to pelt our red weather-beaten faces, and finally Happy yelled from up ahead, We're almost there now. I was cold and wet. I got off the horse and simply led her up the trail. She grunted a kind of groan of relief to be rid of the weight and followed me obediently. She already had quite a load of supplies anyway. There she is, yelled Happy, and in the swirled across top-of-the-world fog, I saw a funny little peaked, almost Chinese cabin among little pointy firs and boulders, standing on a bald rock top surrounded by snow banks and patches of wet grass with tiny flowers. I gulped. It was too dark and dismal to like it. This will be my home and resting place all summer? We trudged on to the log corral built by some old lookout of the thirties and tethered the animals and took down the packs. Happy went in and took the weather door off and got the keys and opened her up. And inside it was all gray, dank, gloomy, muddy floor with rain-stained walls and a dismal wooden bunk with a mattress made of ropes, so as not to attract lightning, and the windows completely impenetrable with dust, and worst of all the floor littered with magazines torn and chewed up by mice, and pieces of groceries too, and uncountable little black balls of rat turd. Well said Wally, showing his long teeth at me. It's going to take you a long time to clean up this mess, eh? Start in right now by taking all those leftover canned goods off the shelf and running a wet soapy rag over that filthy shelf. Which I did, and I had to do. I was getting paid. But good old Happy got a roaring wood fire going in the potbelly stove and put on a pot of water and dumped half a can of coffee in it and yelled, Ain't nothing like real strong coffee up in this country, boy. We want coffee that'll make your hair stand on end. I looked out the windows. Fog. How high are we? Six thousand and a half feet. Well, how can I see any fires? There's nothing but fog out there. In a couple of days it'll all blow away and you'll be able to see for a hundred miles in every direction. Don't worry. But I couldn't believe it. I remembered Han Shan talking about the fog on Cold Mountain, how it never went away. I began to appreciate Han Shan's hardihood. Happy and Wally went out with me, and we spent some time putting up the anemometer pole and doing other chores. Then Happy went in and started a crackling supper on the stove, frying spam with eggs. We drank coffee deep and had a good rich meal. Wally unpacked the two-way battery radio and contacted Ross Float. Then they curled up in their sleeping bags for a night's rest on the floor, while I slept on the damp bunk in my own bag. In the morning it was still gray fog and wind. They got the animals ready, and before leaving turned and said to me, Well, do you still like Desolation Peak? And happy, Don't forget what I told you about answering your own questions now. And if a bar comes by and looks in your window, just close your eyes. The windows howled as they rode out of sight in the mist among the gnarled rock-top trees, and pretty soon I couldn't see them any more, and I was alone on Desolation Peak for all I knew for eternity. I was sure I wasn't going to come out of there alive anyway. I was trying to see the mountains, but only occasional gaps in the blowing fog would reveal distant dim shapes. 
I gave up and went in and spent a whole day cleaning out the mess in the cabin. At night I put on my poncho over my rain jacket and warm clothing and went out to meditate on the foggy top of the world. Here indeed was the great truth cloud, Dharma Mega, the ultimate goal. I began to see my first star at ten, and suddenly some of the white mist parted, and I thought I saw mountains, immense black gooky shapes across the way, stark black and white with snow on top, so near suddenly I almost jumped. At eleven I could see the evening star over Canada, north way, and I thought I could detect an orange sash of sunset behind the fog, but all this was taken out of my mind by the sound of pack rats scratching at my cellar door. In the attic little diamond mice skittered on black feet among oats and bits of rice and old rigs left up there by a generation of desolation losers. Ugh, ow, I thought, will I get to like this? And if I don't, how do I get to leave? The only thing was to go to bed and stick my head under the down. In the middle of the night, while half asleep, I had apparently opened my eyes a bit, and then suddenly I woke up with my hair standing on end. I had just seen a huge black monster standing in my window. And I looked, and it had a star over it, and it was Mount Hosamine, miles away by Canada, leaning over my backyard and staring in my window. The fog had all blown away and it was perfect starry night. What a mountain! It had that same unmistakable witch's tower shape Jaffe had given it in his brush drawing of it that used to hang on the burlap wall in the flowery shack in Corte Madera. It was built with a kind of winding rock-ledge road going around and around, spiraling up to the very top where a perfect witch's tower peaked up and pointed to all infinity. Hosamine, Hosamine, the most mournful mountain I ever seen— and the most beautiful as soon as I got to know it, and saw the northern lights behind it reflecting all the ice of the North Pole from the other side of the world. Chapter 33 Lo, in the morning I woke up, and it was beautiful blue sunshine sky, and I went out in my alpine yard, and there it was. Everything Jaffe said it was. Hundreds of miles of pure snow-covered rocks and virgin lakes and high timber, and below, instead of the world, I saw a sea of marshmallow clouds, flat as a roof and extending miles and miles in every direction, creaming all the valleys, what they call low-level clouds. On my sixty-six hundred-foot pinnacle it was all far below me. I brewed coffee on the stove and came out and warmed my mist-drenched bones in the hot sun of my little wood steps. I said T.T. to a big furry coney, and he calmly enjoyed a minute with me gazing at the sea of clouds. I made bacon and eggs, dug a garbage pit a hundred yards down the trail, hauled wood, and identified landmarks with my panoramic and fire finder, and named all the magic rocks and clefts, names Jaffe had sung to me so often, Jack Mountain, Mount Terror, Mount Fury, Mount Challenger, Mount Despair, Golden Horn, Sourdough, Crater Peak, Ruby, Mount Baker, bigger than the world in the western distance, Jackass Mountain, Crooked Thumb Peak, and the fabulous names of the creeks, Three Fools, Cinnamon, Trouble, Lightning, and Freeze Out. And it was all mine. Not another human pair of eyes in the world were looking at this immense cycloramic universe of matter. I had a tremendous sensation of its dreamlikeness, which never left me all that summer, and in fact grew and grew, especially when I stood on my head to circulate my blood, right on top of the mountain, using a burlap bag for a head mat, and then the mountains looked like little bubbles hanging in the void upside down. In fact, I realized they were upside down, and I was upside down. There was nothing here to hide the fact of gravity holding us all intact upside down against a surface globe of earth in infinite empty space. And suddenly I realized I was truly alone, and had nothing to do but feed myself and rest and amuse myself, and nobody could criticize. The little flowers grew everywhere around the rocks, and no one had asked them to grow, or me to grow. In the afternoon the marshmallow roof of clouds blew away in patches, and Ross Lake was open to my sight, a beautiful cerulean pool far below with tiny toy boats of vacationists, the boats themselves too far to see, just the pitiful little tracks they left rilling in the mirror lake. You could see pines reflected upside down in the lake, pointing to infinity. 
Late afternoon I lay in the grass with all that glory before me and grew a little bored and thought, There's nothing there because I don't care. Then I jumped up and began singing and dancing and whistling through my teeth far across Lightning Gorge, and it was too immense for an echo. Behind the shack was a huge snowfield that would provide me with fresh drinking water till September. Just a bucket a day let melt in the house to dip into with a tin cup, cold ice water. I was feeling happier than in years and years, since childhood. I felt deliberate and glad and solitary. buddy o yidam didam di I sang, walking around kicking rocks. Then my first sunset came, and it was unbelievable. The mountains were covered with pink snow. The clouds were distant and frilly and like ancient remote cities of Buddhaland splendor. The wind worked incessantly, whish, whish, booming at times, rattling my ship. The new moon disk was prognathic and secretly funny in the pale plank of blue over the monstrous shoulders of haze that rose from Ross Lake. Sharp jags popped up from behind slopes, like childhood mountains I grayly drew. Somewhere, it seemed, a golden festival of rejoicement was taking place. In my diary I wrote, Oh, I'm happy. In the late day peaks I saw the hope. Jaffe had been right. As darkness enveloped my mountain, and soon it would be night again, and stars and abominable snowman stalking on Hosamine, I started a cracking fire in the stove, and baked delicious rye muffins and mixed up a good beef stew. A high west wind buffeted the shack. It was well built with steel rods going down into concrete pourings. It wouldn't blow away. I was satisfied. Every time I'd look out the windows, I'd see alpine firs with snow-capped backgrounds, blinding mists, or the lake below all riffled and moony like a toy bathtub lake. I made myself a little bouquet of lupin and mountain posies and put them in a coffee cup with water. The top of Jack Mountain was done in by silver clouds. Sometimes I'd see flashes of lightning far away, illuminating suddenly the unbelievable horizons. Some mornings there was fog, and my ridge, starvation ridge, would be milkied over completely. On the dot, the following Sunday morning, just like the first, daybreak revealed the sea of flat shining clouds a thousand feet below me. Every time I felt bored, I rolled another cigarette out of my can of Prince Albert. There's nothing better in the world than a roll your own deeply enjoyed without hurry. I paced in the bright silver stillness with pink horizons in the west, and all the insects ceased in honor of the moon. There were days that were hot and miserable with locusts of plagues of insects. Winged ants, heat, no air, no clouds. I couldn't understand how the top of a mountain in the north could be so hot. At noon the only sound in the world was the symphonic hum of a million insects, my friends. But night would come, and with it the mountain moon, and the lake would be moon-laned, and I'd go out and sit in the grass and meditate facing west, wishing there were a personal God in all this impersonal matter. I'd go out to my snow field and dig out my jar of purple jello and look at the white moon through it. I could feel the world rolling toward the moon. At night, while I was in my bag, the deer would come up from the lower timber and nibble at leftovers in tin plates in the yard. Bucks with wide antlers, does, and cute little fawns looking like otherworldly mammals on another planet with all that moonlight rock behind them. Then would come wild, lyrical, drizzling rain, from the south, in the wind, and I'd say, The taste of rain, why kneel? And I'd say, Time for hot coffee and a cigarette, boys, addressing my imaginary bhikkhus. The moon became full and huge, and with it came aurora borealis over Mount Hosamine. Look at the void, and it is even stiller, Han Shan had said in Jaffe's translation. And in fact I was so still, all I had to do was shift my crossed legs in the alpine grass and I could hear the hoofs of deers running away somewhere. Standing on my head before bedtime on that rock roof of the moonlight, I could indeed see that the earth was truly upside down, and man a weird vain beetle full of strange ideas, walking around upside down and boasting. And I could realize that man remembered why this dream of planets and plants and plantagenets was built out of the primordial essence. Sometimes I'd get mad because things didn't work out well. I'd spoil a flapjack or slip in the snowfield while getting water. Or one time my shovel went sailing down into the gorge. And I'd be so mad I'd want to bite the mountaintops and would come in the shack and kick the cupboard and hurt my toe. 
But let the mind beware that though the flesh be bugged, the circumstances of existence are pretty glorious. All I had to do was keep an eye on all horizons for smoke and run the two-way radio and sweep the floor. The radio didn't bother me much. There were no fires close enough for me to report ahead of anybody else, and I didn't participate in the lookout chats. They dropped me a couple of radio batteries by parachute, but my own batteries were still in good shape. One night in a meditation vision, Avalokitesvara, the hearer and answerer of prayer, said to me, You are empowered to remind people that they are utterly free. So I laid my hand on myself to remind myself first, and then felt gay, yelled, Ta! opened my eyes, and a shooting star shot. The innumerable worlds in the Milky Way, words. I ate my soup in little doleful bowlfuls, and it tasted much better than in some vast tureen. My jaffy pea and bacon soup. I took two-hour naps every afternoon, waking up and realizing none of this ever happened as I looked around my mountain top. The world was upside down, hanging in an ocean of endless space, and here were all these people sitting in theaters watching movies, down there in the world to which I would return. Pacing in the yard at dusk, singing wee small hours, when I came to the lines, when the whole wide world is fast asleep, my eyes filled with tears. Okay, world, I said, I'll love you. In bed at night, warm and happy in my bag in the good hemp bunk, I'd see my table and my clothes in the moonlight and feel, Poor Raymond boy, his day is so sorrowful and worried. His reasons are so ephemeral. It's such a haunted and pitiful thing to have to live. And on this I'd go to sleep like a lamb. Are we fallen angels who didn't want to believe that nothing is nothing and so were born to lose our loved ones and dear friends one by one and finally our own life, to see it proved? But cold morning would return, with clouds billowing out of lightning gorge like giant smoke, the lake below still cerulean neutral, and empty space the same as ever. Oh, gnashing teeth of earth! Where would it all lead to but some sweet golden eternity to prove that we've all been wrong, to prove that the proving itself was nil? Chapter 34 August finally came in with a blast that shook my house and augured little augusticity. I made raspberry jello the color of rubies in the setting sun. Mad, raging sunsets poured in sea foams of cloud through unimaginable crags, with every rose tint of hope beyond. I felt just like it, brilliant and bleak beyond words. Everywhere awful ice fields and snow straws. One blade of grass jiggled in the winds of infinity, anchored to a rock. To the east it was gray, to the north awful, to the west raging mad, hard iron fools wrestling in the groomian gloom, to the south my father's mist. Jack Mountain, his thousand-foot rock hat overlooked a hundred football fields of snow. Cinnamon Creek was an eerie of Scottish fog. Shull lost itself in the golden horn of bleak. My oil lamp burned in infinity. Poor gentle flesh, I realized. There is no answer. I didn't know anything anymore. I didn't care, and it didn't matter. And suddenly I felt really free. Then would come really freezing mornings, cracking fire. I'd chop wood with my hat on, earmuff cap, and would feel lazy and wonderful indoors, fogged in by icy clouds. Rain, thunder in the mountains. But in front of the stove I read my western magazines. Everywhere snowy air and wood smoke. Finally the snow came in a whirling shroud from Hosamine by Canada. It came swirling my way, sending radiant white heralds through which I saw the angel of light peep. And the wind rose, dark low clouds rushed up as out of a forge. Canada was a sea of meaningless mist. It came in a general fanning attack advertised by the sing in my stovepipe. It rammed it to absorb my old blue sky view, which had been all thoughtful clouds of gold. Far the rum-dum-dum of Canadian thunder, and to the south another vaster, darker storm closing in like a pincer. But Hosamine Mountain stood there returning the attack with a surl of silence. And nothing could induce the gay golden horizons far northeast where there was no storm to change places with desolation. Suddenly a green and rose rainbow shafted right down into Starvation Ridge not three hundred yards away from my door, like a bolt, like a pillar. 
It came among steaming clouds and orange sun turmoiling. What is a rainbow, Lord? A hoop for the lowly. It hooped right into Lightning Creek. Rain and snow fell simultaneously. The lake was milk-white a mile below. It was just too crazy. I went outside, and suddenly my shadow was ringed by the rainbow as I walked on the hilltop, a lovely haloed mystery making me want to pray. Oh, Ray, the career of your life is like a raindrop in the illimitable ocean, which is eternal awakenerhood. Why worry ever any more? Write and tell Jaffe that. The storm went away as swiftly as it came, and the late afternoon lake sparkle blinded me. Late afternoon, my mop drying on the rock. Late afternoon, my bare back cold as I stood above the world in a snowfield, digging shovels full into a pail. Late afternoon, it was I, not the void, that changed. Warm rose dusk, I meditated in the yellow half-moon of August. Whenever I heard thunder in the mountains, it was like the iron of my mother's love. Thunder and snow, how we shall go, I'd sing. Suddenly came the drenching fall rains, all night rain, millions of acres of bow trees being washed and washed. And in my attic, millennial rats, wisely sleeping. Morning, the definite feel of autumn coming, the end of my job coming. Wild, windy, cloud-crazed days now, a definite golden look in the high noon haze. Night, made hot cocoa and sang by the wood fire. I called Han Shan in the mountains. There was no answer. I called Han Shan in the morning fog. Silence, it said. I called. De Pankara instructed me by saying nothing. Mists blew by. I closed my eyes. The stove did the talking. Woo! I yelled, and the bird of perfect balance on the fur point just moved his tail. Then he was gone, and distance grew immensely white. Dark wild nights with hint of bears. Down in my garbage pit, old soured solidified cans of evaporated milk bitten into and torn apart by mighty behemoth paws. Avalokitesvara the bear. Wild cold fogs with awesome holes. On my calendar, I ringed off the fifty-fifth day. My hair was long, my eyes pure blue in the mirror, my skin tanned and happy. All night gales of soaking rain again, autumn rain, but I warm as toast in my bag, dreaming of long infantry scouting movements in the mountains. Cold, wild morning with high wind, racing fogs, racing clouds, sudden bright suns, the pristine light on hill patches, and my fire roaring with three big logs as I exulted to hear Bernie Byers over the radio, telling all his lookouts to come down that very day. The season was over. I paced in the windy yard with cup of coffee forked in my thumb, singing Blubbery Dubbery the Chipmunks in the Grass. There he was, my chipmunk, in the bright, clear, windy, sunny air, staring on the rock. Hands clasping as he sat up straight, some little oat between his paws. He nibbled, he darted away, the little nutty lord of all he surveyed. At dusk, big wall of clouds from the north coming in. Burr, I said. And I'd sing, Yar, but my she was yar, meaning my shack all summer, how the wind hadn't blown it away. And I said, Pass, 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 that which passes through everything. Sixty sunsets had I seen revolve on that perpendicular hill. The vision of the freedom of eternity was mine forever. The chipmunk ran into the rocks and a butterfly came out. It was as simple as that. Birds flew over the shack rejoicing. They had a mile-long patch of sweet blueberries all the way down to the timberline. For the last time I went out to the edge of Lightning Gorge, where the little outhouse was built right on the precipice of a steep gulch. Here, sitting every day for sixty days, in fog or in moonlight or in sunny day or in darkest night, I had always seen the little twisted gnarly trees that seemed to grow right out of the mid-air rock. And suddenly it seemed I saw that unimaginable little Chinese bum standing there, in the fog, with that expressionless humor on his seamed face. It wasn't the real-life Jaffe of rucksacks and Buddhism studies and big mad parties at Corte Madera. It was the realer-than-life Jaffe of my dreams, and he stood there saying nothing. "'Go away, thieves of the mind!' he cried down the hollows of the unbelievable cascades." It was Jaffe who had advised me to come here, and now, though he was seven thousand miles away in Japan, answering the meditation bell, a little bell he later sent to my mother in the mail just because she was my mother, a gift to please her, he seemed to be standing on Desolation Peak, by the gnarled old rocky trees, certifying and justifying all that was here. 
Jaffe, I said out loud. I don't know when we'll meet again or what'll happen in the future, but desolation, desolation, I owe so much to desolation. Thank you forever for guiding me to the place where I learned all. Now comes the sadness of coming back to cities, and I've grown two months older, and there's all that humanity of bars and burlesque shows and gritty love. All upside down in the void, God bless them. But Jaffe, you and me forever, we know, O oh, ever youthful, O oh, ever weeping. Down on the lake, rosy reflections of celestial vapor appeared, and I said, God, I love you, and looked up to the sky and really meant it. I have fallen in love with you, God. Take care of us all, one way or the other. To the children and the innocent, it's all the same. And in keeping with Jaffe's habit of always getting down on one knee and delivering a little prayer to the camp we left, to the one in the Sierra and the others in Marin, and the little prayer of gratitude he had delivered to Sean's shack the day he sailed away, as I was hiking down the mountain with my pack, I turned and knelt on the trail and said, Thank you, Shack. Then I added, Blah, with a little grin, because I knew that Shack and that mountain would understand what that meant, and turned and went on down the trail back to this world.